Today we're going to continue our series, This Changes Everything. Uh, last Sunday, our Easter Sunday, we talked about how uh, creation changed everything, how sin, the entrance of sin changed everything, and then really emphasized you know, how the cross changed everything, and then how faith changes everything. So we're going to continue talking about uh, you know, the changes, things that change because of, uh, of the cross, because of the resurrection of Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about our right standing with God. You know, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus brought about a perfect and complete salvation and restoration of mankind to God once again. And as it was in the beginning in Genesis that we looked at last week, it's been restored back to us again. Fellowship with God, a part of God's family with access to Him through prayer, and also the dominion to rule and reign in this life by Jesus Christ. So uh, as we talk about this changes everything, you know, the Scriptures say in Romans 6.10, it's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. And uh, I'm going to read the, uh, verse 10 there. It says, The death He died, He died to sin once for all, but the, but the life He lives, He lives to God. So, the cross took care of the sin problem. There is no longer a sin problem. There's a sinner problem. We've got to get the message of the gospel. What Jesus' death, his atoning death, his redemptive death, uh, his resurrection, uh, the power of the gospel in the new birth. Uh, we, we have to get this message out to people. That, that, that's the whole thing. So there's not a sin problem. It says here, Jesus died he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives unto God. And then in Romans 4.25, it says, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So this, the problem of sin has been dealt with. Jesus bore the sins of the whole world, and it's once and for all. It, it, there's no other sacrifice. There's no sacrifice that you can do, that I can do. There's nothing we can do to add to it. It is a finished thing. Jesus said it's finished. So it's one sacrifice, four sins, forever. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, let's look over there. Paul, again, is writing on the same theme about justification or righteousness. And in verse 21, he says, God made him, speaking of Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So one sacrifice has settled uh, the issue of sins forever. Jesus was our substitute. Notice here it says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. One translation says to be a sacrifice for sin for us, made to be a sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Jesus was our substitute. He took our place. He took our punishment. He took our sins. And so when we believe on Him, believe in Him, we get His life, His righteousness. We get uh, 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 delivered from wrath and punishment of sin. He was our substitute. He took what we were so that we might become as He is by faith. And so this is, as we're talking about this changes everything, well now all of a sudden we are restored back into right fellowship with God, right in a right relationship. And the Bible calls this righteousness. In some places it uses the term justification. They're both terms that, that signify that, that Jesus paid the price for our sins, uh, our sins have been paid for. We have been forgiven. We are back in right relationship through the new birth. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We've received his life. We've received his righteousness. And we've received his standing before God. So it, he's our substitute. And he's taken away all our sin. He's taken away all our sin consciousness. Now, this is a big thing, I think, with the, with the church world as a whole, is this thing I call sin consciousness. And uh, it, it, it's, it's this sense of feeling unworthy that so many uh, believers feel so unworthy and they feel like, uh, you know, they don't deserve it and they don't, you know, they don't measure up and all those things, you know. And what's happened is, is that you're looking at the old life. You're looking at the old man. But the Bible says 
that as many as us have, have been baptized into Jesus by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, we have put on Christ. And so in Christ, I am justified. You are justified. I am in right standing with God. You're in right standing with God. There is nothing that separates us. There's nothing that Jesus left undone that we need to do to be justified. So we're talking about this changes everything, our right standing with God. So it was a restoration of righteousness. You know, we saw last week in Genesis how that uh, Adam and Eve, they made a bad choice. They made wrong choices, and that wrong choices separated them from God. But now in Christ Jesus, because of his sacrifice at Calvary, taking on our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Now, because he has taken that on, we can be made righteous in God's sight. We don't have to uh, suffer under a feeling of condemnation and guilt anymore. Uh, in Romans, uh, turn back there, if you would, Romans 8 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is now... That means right now for us, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there's no more condemnation. That's the part of law of sin and death. When, when man uh, uh, sinned, when man could not measure up, he was under condemnation. When he couldn't keep the law, when he couldn't keep God's statutes, he, he would immediately fall under condemnation and guilt. But now in Christ, what? There is no more condemnation. We are justified, we are forgiven, we are accepted by God, and we are no longer to walk in that sense of, of, of unworthiness and guilt and shame and condemnation. That all goes with the old life, the old man. And that old man, as Paul tells us in many places throughout the New Testament, has been crucified and buried with Christ. And now the new man has been raised up together with Christ and is seated with him positionally in heavenly places made righteous. So there's no more condemnation. There's no more bondage to sin. In Romans chapter 6, turn back, and again, we're going to look here, we're going to look at verses 6 and 7, and then 11 through 14. Verse 6, he says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That's that old man that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey it in its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as in an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Because we're under grace, all that Jesus did, he did for us. We are partakers. We, we reap the benefit of it in the new birth. Our sins are forgiven. All our sins are forgiven. But even more than that, we receive eternal life. We're made a new creature, and we are counted as justified in Christ Jesus. This is why he says that sin should no longer rule and dominate us, but rather righteousness righteousness, the life of God. Paul put it this way. He said, if you will walk in the spirit, then you won't fulfill the evil desires of the flesh. Now we know this one day we're going to get a new body, but we don't have a new body right now. The new man on the inside that, that that's become new in Christ Jesus through the new birth, you know, he's received the, the life and the nature of God. He's received the righteousness and the right standing with God. But the flesh wants to do the same old things. So what we have to learn to do is have the man on the inside uh, uh, call the shot, so to speak, and be the one who's in charge. And we yield our members, our bodily members, unto righteousness now. And he said, when we do that, he said, sin won't have any control over us. Sin won't have any part in us. Now, I know some people think, well, that's an impossibility. Well, I, you know, you can argue with God in the scriptures here, but he said sin will not have dominion over you. And I believe that that is where God wants us to live. Then no more bondage to sin. And then we have peace with God. You know, here's the thing. When, when man was separated from God, the Bible says that 
that mankind was at odds, at enmity. King James says we, we were enemies of God in our minds, in, in our way of living, in our way of thinking. And, and, it, and, it, and of, because of that, there was no peace. There was no peace between us. We were at odds with one another. But notice what he says in Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified, there's that word, are declared righteous through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So we see we have peace here with God because of the new birth, because uh, we have been justified. We stand in a place uh, uh, of right standing with God. God's not mad at us. God's not mad at you. Where there's no enmity between us and God. There's peace by the cross of Jesus. There's peace by the blood of Jesus. There's peace because now we, all our sins have been forgiven and we've been made new and we've been justified by grace. And that's the beautiful thing. And not only that, but he says here, fellowship is restored. Notice he said, he said uh, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. So fellowship and access to God is restored. We're able to go boldly, as Paul says in Hebrews 4, he said, come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, James says this, he said, the, the effectual prayer of a righteous man uh, releases great power. So because of this right standing, now we have access to God in prayer. We have access. We can come boldly before the throne of God and make our requests known with confidence, with assurance, because we have now received this righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imparted and given to us and put to our account. And so now we can approach God without shame, without guilt, without condemnation, and with great confidence and boldness. Also, it has to do with the restoration of of our dominion. Dominion over Satan and his works. Dominion over sin. This is what, uh, when, uh, you know, we looked at this when Adam and Eve, when they were created, God said, let them rule, uh, you know, over uh, God's creation here. He said, let, he, then he gave them a charge, you know, to rule over it, subdue it, and so forth. Well, that's been restored in Christ Jesus. Listen right here in Romans 5, Paul writing in verse 17. He said, for if by the trespass of the one man, that's Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift, I want you to look at this, gift of righteousness. You can't earn it. It's a gift. The gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now he said, just as when uh, Adam sinned, and so he lost that dominion, and sin became his master and ruler rather than him being the one to exercise dominion. Now, in Christ Jesus, he said much more because of the life, because of the free gift of righteousness that's been given to us, uh, because of Jesus Christ, he said we are to reign in life. Now, I don't know what that means to you, but to me, to reign means to rule. It means to have a dominion. You've never seen a king, you know, <laughs> without a dominion. He rules, he reigns. And so God is wanting us to rule and reign in our life. Not other people, but in our life, we can rule and reign because we're in right standing with God. When the enemy comes, we can put him to flight. When we need to go to God in prayer to make our request known, we can come with confidence and boldness. So this restoration of righteousness, this right standing, this this uh, uh, place that now in position that we have in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father, it gives us all kind of access, all kind of privileges as sons and daughters of the Most High God. The problem is, many times, is we do not exercise it because we have been taught uh, in many cases, erroneously, we've been taught religiously that, you know, we're just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, that, you know, that was true. We were an old sinner, but we got saved by grace, but God didn't leave you a sinner. He said that, that in the new birth, you become a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You have received the, the free gift of righteousness. So things are not the same. We are, we're, our standing with God is now as God intended it in the beginning. And we can rule and reign in our life over every attack of the enemy, 
over lack, over sickness. God intends for us to take our authority and take the promise of God, take our right standing with God and begin to live out a brand new life by the faith in God and by his righteousness that gives us access into his presence. So how do we put this righteousness to work? Now, I won't be able to look at all of these, but we're going to look at just a few things. We're talking about our right standing with God. This changes everything. It absolutely does. I want you to get that. This changes everything, our standing with God. And listen, God did it. I didn't do it. You didn't do it. God did it in Christ Jesus. So, you know, he said it's finished on the cross. So it's done. It's a done thing. And so if God did it, it's done right. So we just need to take advantage of it. God wants us by faith to, to take advantage of the grace that has come to us in Christ Jesus in the new birth and in the gift of righteousness. So how do we put it to work? Let's look at just a few things. We won't look at many of them. Number one, and I've already kind of uh, alluded to this a little bit, in spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul is speaking here. Of course, he'd been talking about the armor of God and so forth. He says, stand firm then with the belt of truth, buckle around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And he says, uh, if you go back up a few verses, he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his uh, might and put on the full armor of God. The breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate covered the most vital areas of the Roman soldier. It covered his heart, his lungs, uh, his, his, his uh, abdomen, those areas. It went down a long way. So it covered the most vital areas. You know, when Satan wants to attack us, he's called the accuser of the brethren. And so he's always throwing his fiery darts of accusation against you that you're no good that you don't measure up that God don't love you that you did do this and you should have done that and he tries to get you under condemnation and that's when you need to make sure that you've got on the breastplate of righteousness and you remind yourself and you remind the devil look there's there therefore now no condemnation because I'm in Christ Jesus I have been made and given the gift of righteousness the righteousness of God and I'm in right standing with God and you have no place and no part in my life and I will not uh, entertain and listen to your accusa accusations. That is using that breastplate of righteousness, having it in place. And, you know, when the enemy attacks, you know, he attacks through those thoughts, those fiery darts, as Paul put them, that come to our mind. That's when we've got to resist. Peter said, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. And so we do that by what? By the breastplate of righteousness. We're in right standing. Not because we did everything just right, but because Jesus did everything just right. And now his righteousness has become yours and mine. Exercising authority boldly. This goes hand in hand with what we're talking about here over demonic powers. Exercising uh, 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 our authority over demonic powers. Now he, had, he says here, you know, in the armor of God, he said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. He said, it's against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of even, uh, evil in the heavenly realm. So it's a spiritual conflict that we're in. This armor that he's referring to and using this analogy, it is spiritual. It is by faith, by faith in Christ Jesus. It is, it is given to us uh, by the finished work of Jesus Christ, but we access it by faith. We put on the armor by faith and we activate it by faith. Not by our feelings, not by what the enemy says, but by what God says. So we can exercise our authority boldly in Christ Jesus. I love this scripture over here in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Let me get over there. Notice what he says here. He says, well, let me get over one more page. 20, 28, 1, the wicked flee. Though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. You know what will help your boldness in God? When you recognize and accept and believe that 
The righteousness of Jesus has been given to you by grace. It has been imparted to you. You're in right standing with God. You can't get a better right standing than being in Christ Jesus. That's where our right standing is. And because of that, we can be bold. We can be bold in our prayer life. We can be bold in our resisting of the enemy when he attacks us with his fiery darts, his thoughts, and his, his attacks on our life. We can be bold about it. You know, bold means, uh, it doesn't mean to be arrogant. It just means I am absolutely assured of my standing with God. I'm absolutely assured that what God has said, it is mine, and I have it by faith, and I'm going to enjoy it by faith, and I'm going to stand up and resist every attack of the enemy, every, every, uh, every thought contrary to the Word of God, I'm going to resist it, and He's going to flee from me. And I'm going to be bold about it. And in my prayer life, I can be bold. Paul says in, in Hebrews 4, he said, come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, if you feel like you're unworthy and you're a worm and you're no good, you're not going to come boldly to the throne of grace. And many times, this is what is hindering our receiving from God, even though God want, has already promised it and He wants us to have it, is we come whining. We come feeling so unworthy. We come, you know, feeling with all this shame on us. Listen, you said, yeah, but I, I've missed it. Well, the, here's the cure for that. Let me give you, uh, uh, how do you maintain, or I'll call it righteousness maintenance. You know, uh, 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 you know, I own a vehicle, and, and probably you do too, you know, and, and ever so often, you know, there's certain maintenance, regular maintenance that has to be done to keep that car uh, working in the same condition as when we bought it new. You know, you got to get the oil changed. You got to get, you know, different, the tires rotated, all those different things that you know about. Well, righteousness maintenance is this. The apostle John said this. He said, he said, if we will confess our sins, if you sinned, he said, if you, I, we will confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do we maintain it? We confess our sin. We go to the Father and say, Father, I've sinned. Uh, you know, and, you know, and here's the thing, name it, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, name it and claim it. And then ask the Father for forgiveness. And he said that he would forgive us. He said, and not only that, he said, but he will also uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that's how we maintain our righteousness, our right standing with God so that we can be bold in prayer and we can bold, be bold in our spiritual warfare against the enemy. It makes our prayers, as I mentioned, powerful and effective. I, I alluded to this before, but I want to go over there and read it in James 5, latter part of verse 16. He said, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, you know, Many Christians read that and say, yeah, boy, if I was just, if I could only be righteous, if I could only be good enough, if I could only measure up, man, I'm, boy, wouldn't I be something at praying? But listen, it's not about, that's not the righteous, that's the righteousness of man you're talking about. What you can do, what you feel like you ought to do, what you should have done, what you could have done. Don't misunderstand me. I'm all for living right. We ought to live right. But listen, all the right living in the world, all the morality in the world won't make you right before God. The only way you can be justified before God is by faith in Jesus Christ and through grace being born again and receiving the free gift of righteousness. So once you know, you know what? I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So I can come boldly, I can pray, and my prayers will be effective, and they will be powerful because I'm in right standing with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. I want to tell you what, that'll make you want to go get down to some prayer business and take care of some things in prayer because you have a confidence, I have a confidence and a boldness because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's been given to you. We're talking about our right standing with God and how this changes everything. It changes our position. It changes our fellowship. It changes our, 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 uh, our relationship not only to God but to sin. Sin will no longer have dominion over us. It gives us access to God so that we can boldly come to the throne of grace. And as James says, we can be effective, pray effective and powerful prayers that get answered, that change circumstances and put the enemy to flight. And then, you know, finally, we need to do this. We need to confess that He is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 
Listen to this. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He said, it is because of him, speaking of God the Father, that you're in Christ Jesus. It's because of who? It's because of God Almighty, God the Father, that you're in Christ Jesus by the new birth, who has become for us, notice this, wisdom from God. That is our righteousness. Jesus has become our righteousness. Jesus has become your righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I confess that I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of the grace of God, because of the new birth, all because of what Jesus did, I'm not boasting in myself. I'm boasting in the Lord. I'm boasting in what he has done. He has paid the price, paid the penalty. My sins are forgiven. I'm in right standing with God. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. I am. And if you're a believer, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you need to be confessing that to yourself in your own prayer time, your own prayer closet. Just, just go and read the Scripture and declare it. You say, but I don't feel like it. Yeah, but we don't live by feelings. We live by faith, the faith of the Son of God. We live by faith. And this is what it's all about. So our right standing with God, it's, this is a beautiful thing. And I encourage you to go and, and study it out even more than, than, than what I'm able to share with you in this short time together uh, here online. And, and it will absolutely revolutionize uh, the way you see your relationship to God, your relationship to sin, your relationship to, de- to, to, the, to the enemy, the devil, and absolutely change and revolutionize your prayer life. Let me ask you a couple things. Here's some action points. Are you laboring under condemnation and guilt? Listen, if you know that you know that you've asked Jesus to come into your life and be your Savior and you to forgive you of your sins and to make you a brand new person, listen, then you don't need to labor under that condemnation and guilt any longer. That's the enemy. That's the accuser. If you have sin, listen, let's confess it. Confess it to God, uh, get it under the blood, let him uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness and let that position of yours uh, shine forth brightly that you're the righteousness of God. And then renew your mind to harmonize with the new creation man. Find out what the scripture says about uh, your right standing with God. And then by faith, you accept that. You declare that. You get your mind renewed. and You let it harmonize with what God says and not what you feel and not what somebody else says, but what God says. And then finally, we walk by faith and not by feelings. Absolutely. You know, we walk by faith, don't we? Faith in the finished work of Jesus, faith in what he has done, faith in the grace of God, faith in the new birth, faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, and faith in the righteousness of God that's been imparted to us. Father, right now, I pray for those who are listening today. Lord, those who are believers and have been laboring under condemnation and guilt. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that the light of the truth of the gospel, Father, from this message will begin to penetrate. They will see that they are new creation beings in Christ Jesus. And they will begin to walk in the free gift of righteousness. They'll, they'll begin to walk above condemnation and guilt. They'll begin to walk in a new confidence and a new boldness as they realize their right standing with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just before we go today, I want to read a scripture there on the screen. As is usual, you will see the different ways uh, that you can give if you so desire to give. Uh, You you can give by text, online, um, credit card, different ways are on Scripture. I want to read you something here. Paul is speaking about the Corinthians. He's talking about whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that all times and all things you have all that you need. You will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. And then he goes on down in verse 10. He said, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You know, as we uh, give of our tithes and offerings and those of you who are part of uh, 
the Passion Church, your faith promise offerings, you know, that because we have been made righteous freely by God, God has given us that free gift of righteousness. We're in right standing with Him. So we're connected to the God of the universe. We're connected to God. And He owns it all. And when we begin to give, you know what we're doing? We're Give, it is an expression, Paul says, of that right standing with God. Because of the joy we have in our right standing with God, we are free now from the love of money, and we are free to sow uh, so that others uh, will be blessed, so that others can hear the gospel. And he said that there will be a harvest of your righteousness Uh, that act of righteousness by sowing into other people's lives, he said, God will make it to come back to you. Thank you for your giving, for your faithfulness. And remember this, you know, that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Believe it, live in it, and enjoy it. God bless you.